after this conference, uh, there's another little handful of people for confession. So those who signed up for confession after this conference. But now, do I need to expose the Blessed Sacrament first? No, at 9 o'clock. At 9 o'clock. Okay. Did that go all night? Yeah, all night. So it's in the morning. Okay. Very good. Sleep about three to four hours. I might pop in. What do you call a city that has 20 million chicks in it? Chick Bill. <laughs> New York City. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. 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 Heavenly Father, the teaching of the communion saints gives us hope that those who have gone before us continue to intercede for us and are with us, helping us to have hope and to be examples to us in embracing our humanity so that we may become divinized children of our good Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Particularly St. Teresa, St. John the Cross, our Carmelite saints, may you continue to pray for us, watch over us, guide us, and teach us. Amen. Amen. This isn't so much a teaching of St. Teresa as it is an understanding of the sacred humanity of our good Lord Jesus. It is a doctrine of our faith that Jesus, both divine and human, the Word became flesh, dwelt among us. He was one of us in all ways but sin. The question of Jesus in his human nature, was he conscious of the mission he had been given? Was he aware of the love of the Father for him? And yes, he was very conscious of who he was in his human nature. And he had an understanding and a deep relation with of course, being God with his Father. We see him at prayer constantly, alone on the mountain, in conversation with prayer, with dependence on the Father. St. Teresa realized this, she knew this, she experienced it, literally, the indwelling presence of God. So the, she heard Jesus speak to her, guiding her, teaching her, protecting her. And her very title indicates her own personal spirituality. It was of Jesus, Teresa of Jesus. Like I've mentioned you be, to all of you before and to the new ones, that the title you embrace is part of your spirituality. It speaks of who you are. There's something about the title that you have embraced that speaks of your spirituality and all that comes from that particular spirituality. Dive into it. Learn it. Use it. Live by it. 
Jesus, Teresa of Jesus teaches us this. And her whole life was Christocentric. And our Carmelite tradition is Christocentric. It's all of Christ, by Christ, for Christ, with Christ. In Him, through Him, with Him. So she had a as tremendous a love of the sacred humanity of Jesus as one could have. And she was one of the women instrumental in bringing back a devotion and an under, true understanding of the sacred humanity of Christ. There, are other, there would be other women to follow in this tradition or this um, re- Understanding of the humanity of Christ. Remember the other night, or yesterday, I tried to say that part of the theologians or spiritual, some of her spiritual directors, the teachings on prayer back in her time were do not meditate on the humanity of Christ. It can lead to abuses or um, sentimentalism, it could lead to emotionalism, it could be led to sensuality. This is what they were afraid of. But Teresa was being pulled to understand the sacred humanity of Jesus, not just his divinity. Jesus is one in his divinity and his humanity. He receives his humanity from his divinity. And I'll, and I'll quote there from the Catechism as well. But her tremendous overwhelming devotion to the sacred humanity of Jesus produced a lifestyle by which we follow writings and teachings that help us to cultivate and to make fruitful our own spiritual life and so Trying to put together an understanding, Teresa's understanding and her devotion to the sacred humanity of Jesus. So it's not so much a teaching, because the church teaches us, but her experience, if I can convey this properly, and it needs to be continued, I think, studied, on the sacred humanity of Jesus. In her life, chapter 22, her life, chapter 22, number 6. This is to me the all-encompassing quote that helps us to know her devotion to this truth about our Lord. If we are going to please the Lord and receive His great favors, we must do so through the most sacred humanity of Christ. Many times have I perceived this truth through experience. The Lord has told it to me. I have definitely seen that we must enter by this gate if we desire His Sovereign Majesty to show us His great secrets. For her, the sacred humanity of Christ was the door to the secrets of the Father taught by the Spirit, and lived by the Word made flesh. Not just the mystery of who Christ is, but the mystery of the Godhead, the mystery of creation, the mystery of the plan of salvation. We are, as she says, to please the Lord and receive His great favors. It's not just saying with the divinity of Christ, we must, of course, not separate him, but make his our devotion to the humanity of Christ and the divinity, his divinity, as one. And she says here, I perceive this truth, so it's a truth, through experience. She uses experience 
in a proper way. She always used her experience up against and measured by Holy Scripture. This is what I have against some of the feminist theologians. They just take experience as something valid in and of itself, regardless of what Holy Scripture says. That's why I don't read them. Constance Fitzgerald, be very aware of her. Elizabeth Johnson, be very aware of her. They are bit off. Be very careful of the feminists, as well as some of the men, the old. I want to try to guide you in this. <coughs> to use experience as something valid by which we learn, by which we gain wisdom, but we must always check it against Holy Scripture and the teachings of the church. And good counsel, good discernment, and so on. And this is what Teresa did. She never acted on her own with the experiences she had with God, spiritually, with other people, in her own adventures. She always was careful just not taking experience what happened to her centrally or spiritually as the truth as well she always was very prudent and checking her experiences with the church with a learned spiritual director and with Holy Scripture. And she gives testimony that it was the Lord has told it to me. And as she says, we must enter by this gate, his sacred humanity, if we desire to know the secrets of our Lord Jesus. If he desired us to know the Father's secrets, as he said to his apostles, I no longer call you slaves or servants, I call you friends. So her determination produced good fruit in helping to restore a devotion to the sacred humanity of Christ for the faithful. Others were uh, St. Margaret uh, Alacoque, St. Bernadette, who was one of my favorites. Joan of Arc, too, was one of my favorites. And Therese, St. Therese. To bring back, not to be cautious of giving devotion to the sacred humanity of Christ. And to meditate on the scenes of our Lord Jesus in the Gospel. Quoting Father Otilio Rodriguez, that, you know, St. Teresa saw in Jesus' true humanity the best way to please God and to gain his friendship. That in the sacred humanity is the remedy for all our distresses, our failings, our weaknesses. Did the word have to become flesh? Could not God save us in other ways? Well, the church fathers, and I have come to understand, yes, God had to become one of us. The incarnation had to take place in order for redemption to happen. Otherwise, we would have no model. We'd have no exemplar. We'd have no focus by which we are to learn about redemption and about how to live according, accordingly to have redemption. The Word of God had to come in the flesh, die for us, and rise. And it only shows God's love for us, of how much He wanted to be with us, to be present to us, and to show us 
how to attain a divine level of being human. Sacred humanity, as Father Otilio writes about how Teresa saw, let me repeat this, Jesus is true humanity. That in sacred humanity is the remedy for all our distresses, our failings, our weakness. He teaches us how to live. He teaches us how to meet the problems and the issues of life. He teaches us the purpose and the meaning of life. Shows us how to fight off temptation. He shows us how to engage in people who want to eradicate God, to eradicate the faith. He teaches us how to embrace suffering, how to pray, how to heal. All the things that Jesus has shown us. is for our good, how for us how to engage in life and to prepare and desire eternal life. Their quote was from the Theresian Gospel by Father Otilio. It's a little book. You probably have it in your library. Her very title, as I said, of Jesus, indicated her complete desire and dedication and faith in the sacred humanity of Christ. It is what influenced her, as I mentioned the other night, to undergo her conversion. The Ece Homo, behold the man, the suffering man, the man God. Sacred humanity is what influenced her to cultivate and desire this wisdom about the Word incarnate. She says in her life, again from chapter 22, but a couple of or paragraphs before the opening quote, chapter 22, number 4, I had been so devoted all my life to Christ. In my opinion, she writes in the interior castle, first mansion, in my opinion, we shall never completely know ourselves if we don't strive to know God. Here's again the self-knowledge. We want to know ourselves, we have to know God. Some theologians say we start with God, then we can come to know ourselves. Others, and it's valid, start with ourselves, know who we are, know what kind of being we are, it should lead us then to loving God and wanting to know God. But she says we shall never completely know ourselves if we don't strive to know God. We start with the life of Christ. I have a reading plan. You know, F.J. Sheen, he wrote this reading plan for life. It's a little out of, you know, we don't have to in the 60s before he died but to put together a reading plan my first reading was the gospel you know jesus christ from the gospels not so much from the commentaries but from the gospels like god speaking to me and then i read the rest of the bible and then i began to look at by bi so-called biographies of jesus Then from there, everything else could be studied. What the church is, what grace is, what suffering is, what the mission are meant to be, what the sacraments are, and so on. But it all begins with Christ. To know Christ first. And she also wrote a book, To Know Christ, To Know Jesus Christ. I really recommend F.J. Sheed. And to know Christ then is to know then a true and authentic spirituality. If you have, if you want a, if you want an authentic spirituality, check to see if it has Christ in it. 
Otherwise, it's not authentic. It's not complete. It's not full. You know, they talk about New Age spirituality. They talk about Hindu spirituality. They talk about spirituality this, spirituality that. Where's Christ in it? Nowhere. It might, he might be referred to, but it's not a true spirituality. Maybe a human spirituality, a natural spirituality, but it's not true and authentic spirituality because a true and authentic spirituality is Christ-centered. I may be bold in saying we have the only true authentic spirituality in mankind's history. But people want to, some people want to avoid it because it means so much. <laughs> because it asks of us So much. But really, it's not all that much. It's just a loving heart. But be careful when you read about spiritualities. Where's Christ in it? Christian mysticism never leaves out the God man, Jesus Christ. That's why I say always bring Christ into the situation, whatever it may be your life. Always bring Christ into it. How, what are you teaching me in this, Lord? What are you showing me? What am I to, how am I to react? How am I to re be, how am I to respond to this? I mean, really began to bring Christ into everything. Everything. No matter how mundane or simple. Just walking, gesturing, saying hello to people on the street. I always kept thinking, you know, it's Jesus. You know, Jesus. And then, you know, we're taking care of oneself, trying to put order in my life. I get criticized for being a clean, a person who likes to have things clean. <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> I like things clean. <laughs> What's the matter with that? Well, I get laughed at for it. Anyway, but I bring Christ in it. John the Cross was this way. He liked clean things. He brought Christ into everything. I want to be like St. John the Cross. That was my title when I was a secular order, third order. Jerome of St. John of the Cross. So part of my name, I, to myself, quietly, through John the Cross, as well as the Mother of God. But from her early childhood then, as she said, she was so devoted all to Christ. She quickly learned to keep Christ present to her in some way. How was this done? Well, first of all, she acknowledges an Augustinian nun who taught her how to meditate on Christ particularly the scene in the Garden of Olives. She also learned from the letters of St. Jerome, which spoke of the life of Christ. She was very devoted to St. Jerome. She learned a lot about Christ from St. Jerome's commentaries and letters. And there was a book used very much at in Teresa's time, in the what we would call now the seminaries. It was called The Life of Christ, and it was by this Carthusian, Carthusian monk, Ludolf of Saxony. He wrote commentaries on the New Testament, on the gospel scenes of Christ. Yes, it's, it's the Samaritan woman where you know, Martha Mary, she got a lot of her favorite scenes from this uh, multi-volume work on the life of Christ by this Ludolf of Saxony. Again, the Samaritan woman, which she liked very much, Martha and Mary, and definitely the crucifixion and the resurrection to help her in prayer. And very much the titles that she would design for to, to talk about Christ. 
went over to the University of Dallas one day to see if they had this multi-volume. Uh, I didn't even know it was a multi-volume. Father Rayfield asked me once. Uh, he said, do you know Ludolf of Saxony? He said, no, I don't. I go, what about him? He said, I don't know anything either. I just simply saw his name in reference to St. Teresa. So being a former librarian, I'm on the hunt. <laughs> You choose this mission? Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I shall investigate. I went over one day to the University of Dallas and looked up, you know, do they have this Ludolf of Saxony? And yes, they do. There's the call number, so I went up to the floor. Here was the shelf of this of this wall. You know, oh no. <laughs> and then I took the one out. It was all in Latin. I go, oh no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> so I just looked at it. I looked at <laughs> osmosis. <laughs> um, I learned to look. <laughs> so I go back to the computer. English translation of Ludolf of Saxony. None done. <laughs> so a book that was so crucial in St. Teresa's life is just waiting for someone to tackle it, to translate it. And it may give us an uh, indirect appreciation of, again, Teresa's love for Jesus. Deep in her love for our Lord. Okay? But those were the influences on her early on in her life. This Augustinian nun, the letters of St. Jerome, and the life of Christ by the Carthusian monk, <coughs> Rudolph. I almost became a Carthusian. You know that? Up in Vermont? What I did. <laughs> Anyway, I have a love for the Carthusians. So these mystical experiences she had of Christ, all these influences and experiences of Christ's sacred humanity, taught her to understand God's plan of salvation, to distinguish the historical from the divine present moment of reality. And that's important. She talks about this in the interior castle. Sacred humanity of Christ taught her how, how would I put it? To have faith in Holy Scripture, in the Word of God. But the Word of God, if I can get this straight, you know, it, it is, although some want to, to deny this, is they are historical. When Jesus was a historical man, he was a his, he was a and from the historical fact, then, we can have faith in divine revelation. If Jesus said these things and these things happened factually, and there are witnesses for it, then but there is divine revelation. And then with the church, as taking from the prophets that this was going to happen in history. Then the interpretation on these historical events and opening up what divine revelation is, then we can have an assured faith and confidence in what God has done for us, what he has revealed, and believe completely in the man God, Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus the Christ, our Savior, our Redeemer, the Messiah. This is, this is what, this to distinguish historical from the divine present moment of reality. It, it comes together. History and the divine come together 
to make reality. We can believe in this. There's a reality, as I said, behind the reality. We don't have to doubt this. Some people want to doubt it. They want to refute it. They want to destroy it. We don't want to believe in this reality. This is why history has to be so important. We have a correct understanding of history. Read Christopher Dawson, perhaps one of the greatest Catholic historians to date. He died in the 60s. But gives the true understanding of the Catholic uh, presence in history, and and especially during the Middle Ages and then afterwards. But this is what she, you know, from the from the sacred humanity. Correct. She talks about this in the interior castle, and I forgot which mansion it is. But to distinguish the historical from the divine present moment of reality, and human wisdom from divine wisdom. Here's where her experience produced good fruit. That human wisdom just is not what we see and sense and what we can reason. There's a divine wisdom that transcends, that transcends reason, that transcends our human language, that transcends human history, human wisdom. This is how she Way acknowledges how she could understand the indwelling presence of the Lord, how her visions and ecstasies occurred so much after the Eucharist, after Holy Communion, and her post Thanksgiving prayers. Jesus was teaching her, literally, in those moments about Himself, about history, about the divine reality and what she wants us to experience one reason why again she wrote her testimonies for us to embrace this truth and have absolutely no doubt about it in the catechism of the catholic church number 470 it is expressed now this is how the church expresses the sacred humanity of christ the church had to recall on each occasion, these were during the times of heresy, the church had to recall on each occasion that Christ's human nature belongs as his own. It's truly his. He truly is human. Belongs as his own to the divine person of the Son of God who assumed it. Everything that Christ is and does in this nature, human nature, derives from one of the Trinity, being the second person of the Trinity. He derives his humanity, the word derives his humanity from his divinity. The Son of God, therefore, communicates to his humanity his own personal mode of existence in the Trinity. In his soul, as in his body, Christ thus expresses humanly get this expresses humanly the divine ways of the trinity you get that Christ worked and acted as one of us in all things except sins therefore only in the mystery of the incarnate word does the mystery of man take on understanding and light that last sentence comes from Gaudium and Spes, number 22. So this is saying that Christ, yes, is true man, true God. They are one. He derives his humanity from the divinity. That's why Christ Jesus, in his humanity, he had to learn things. He had to learn how to eat. He had to learn how to walk. He had to learn how to speak. He had to learn how to... Uh, cleanse himself and and, and, and and to use the hammer and to uh, do all the things he could he had to do as being human. 
But it is, but it is deriving from his divinity, his mission that he always knew he had received from the Father in obedience. And and so, as it says, Christ in his humanity, in his body, expresses humanly the divine ways of the Trinity. This is what we are to do, my friends. In our humanity, we can express the ways of the Trinity. If we're made in the image and likeness of God, we can act divinely. Not sometime in the future, but right now. It's possible. We are made in the image and likeness of God, sharing to a degree in various attributes of God. Then we ourselves can act divinely. And this is why, also, Jesus' sacred humanity will always be above our humanity. I think, some people think, that Christ's humanity is on an equal par with our humanity. That our humanity is somehow on an equal par with Jesus' humanity. It's not. Jesus is above us, showing us how to elevate our humanity into a divine human reality. You understand what I'm saying? This is why the Word became incarnate, to show us how to transcend ourselves and not stay in this natural humanity, in this form of being limited. God wants us, desires us, to transcend our natural humanity into a supernatural humanity, into a divine humanity. This is what G Teresa was experiencing and which awed her. For St. Teresa Christ particularly was experienced then as God. And, and as she would say, was she experienced Christ as servant, as teacher, as friend, as by bridegroom, as majesty, friend above uh, of all friends, good, Above all good, in the, word, in the way of perfection, chapter 2, number 9, she presents our Lord in his humility. She says, let us in some manner resemble our king, who had no house but the stable in Bethlehem, where he was born, and the cross, where he died. In the interior castle, the seventh, excuse me, the seventh mansion, chapter 4, she speaks of Christ as slave, and for us to be his slaves really repeating St. Paul, be a slave of Christ if we wish to be truly spiritual. That's why she said it's not a matter of having mystical phenomena that makes us spiritual, that makes us divine. It's being a slave to God, being obedient to his truth, following his son's way. living, expressing the divine love. That's why I, tell, I say we are to be living on a mystical level. This is the New Testament era. It's completely different than what we were to understand life being before Christ came. We are, we are drawn into this mystery we are closer to the divine than anyone else in history has been. <laughs> As teacher and master, Jesus teaches us to pray. St. Teresa's commentary on the Our Father. He also becomes the true book, she says. The true book in which I saw the truths of his ways. It's from her life, chapter 26, number 5. He is friend, bridegroom, when Christ comes to her in a vision and makes her his bride. This is in her testimonies, number 31. 
For St. Teresa, the most sacred humanity of Christ is where we encounter God most intimately. And why now St. John Paul II said, don't be afraid to be human. What he meant was saying, don't be afraid to be divinely human. This is how we're going to encounter God. The means of that growing spiritually and growing in wisdom, the wisdom of God, and the way of knowledge and of keep to keep the presence of God alive and flamed within us and to, and to experience the indwelling, abiding Father, Son, and Holy Spirit within our hearts, within our souls. Knowing that Christ and His divine humanity, as Teresa said, we become more properly human in the manner that the Father desires us to be. So then, when it comes to prayer and contemplation, she says it is necessary not to withdraw through one's own efforts from all our good and health, which is from and with and by the sacred humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ. I had tried to assure them, he's writing in the interior of Castle, this, the sixth mansion, I assure them, sisters, or whoever is reading it, that they will not enter these last two dwelling places. They will not hit upon the right road unless we have a life in the sacred humanity of Christ. Meaning our, elevating our human, our natural humanity into a divine humanity. Like being Christ-like, to put it simply. St. Teresa taught that the contemplative growth of the soul was affected by the humanity of Christ. Meaning to be moved, inspired, influenced. Why she would say continually look at him then, fall in love with him. This is her practice of recollection, which was to focus on the sacred humanity of Christ. So she says then, in her life, chapter 22, and in the interior of castle, again, the sixth mansion, to be always withdrawn <coughs> from corporeal things and enkindled in love is a trait of angelic spirits. You want to be angelic? Withdraw from corporeal things. I mean, don't depend upon them. For a full life. John the Cross says this. Being kindled in the love of God, it makes us then the angelic. It helps us to transcend our mortal being. It's necessary, she says, that we speak to, think about, and become companion of those who, having had a mortal body, accomplished what they accomplished. Great feats for God. The saints. She's talking about the saints. The communion of saints. How much more is it necessary not to withdraw through one's own efforts from all our good and health, which is the most sacred humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ? She's always, she's always. I almost went through all through almost every page of two of her works. And almost, almost on every page, she's the sacred humanity of Christ. The sacred humanity of Christ. If there's one thing she contributed, her focus in Carmel, it was the sacred humanity of Christ. Just as St. Therese contributed the mercy of God. Rita Stein contributed a Carmelite perspective on truth. St. Raphael Kolonowski contributed a perspective on community. What do we individually want to contribute to Carmel? You've got to find that yourself. With Teresa, it was the sacred humanity of Christ. That's what she honed in on, that's what she focused, and that's what she cultivated more than anything else. To learn about prayer, about being what it is God desires us, meaning to be with Him, what union God means. It's all through the sacred humanity of Christ. Why the 
missing the humanity of Christ? He's always saying, because God never abandons us. God lowered himself to our level. He expects us to do the same to those who are less fortunate than us. To those who are in need of love. Who are in need of being taught. Who are in need of an angel, so to speak. Who are in need of someone to help them rise above their turmoil, their addictions, their troubles, their doubts, their fears. To get them up out of the gutter. That's why codependency is not a Catholic approach to problems. Codependency is a, what, you know, is a term. You know, codependency is a danger. Don't ever be a codependent. <laughs> you get caught in the other person's problem. Anyway, he said, because God never abandoned us. He never will. We abandoned. We betray people. But God will never betray us. He will never abandon us. And this is what she sees about the sacred humanity. When the Word became flesh, God never leaving us behind. To me, that's part of what Jesus meant when he said, you know, what's, what are, what's left over after the multiplication of the fishes and the loaves? Pick up the fragments. He doesn't even want to waste the fragments. He's not, God's not going to abandon anything. He makes good out of everything. Even what's tossed off. We toss things off. God doesn't. Everyone, everything he's created, he's going to glorify in some way. There'll be nothing left behind. We are to do the same. Doesn't mean we always have to be with people. But at least we offer prayers for them. Lord, give them your mercy. Give them the graces they need. Take my offering. And use it as you see suitable. So she says that never abandon. One is never to abandon Christ's sacred humanity and what it represents, what it teaches us, who it is. Because most of all, it helps us to grow in humility. We reflect the humility of the humility of Christ in our life. That's one of the reasons. Now she's teaching us what the sacred humanity of Christ is for us. One, it's for growth in humility. How to be humble. How to be Christ-like. Secondly, for growth in the mystical life. Since our Catholic spirituality and our tradition is centered on Christ, and most of all our Carmelite treasure is being crystal centered. It's for our growth in the mystical life. The same humanity of Christ is meant for our mystical, our maturing and our growth in the mystery, not just of Him alone, but of the entire plan of salvation. Thirdly, for deepening our gratitude to Christ for what he has done for us and given us, as well as helping us to cultivate a healthy and authentic divine love for neighbor in imitation of Christ. And fourthly, for our detachment, our detachment, <laughs> Our, for our detachment from and purification of limited corporeal objects that may take us away from God. We tend to seek God through created things. We can use created things because they are good to teach us about God, God's attributes. They are not God themselves, but they do can teach us about things. Things of God, traits of God. You know, I use, I'll come back to that. We tend to seek God through created things, but Christ's most sacred humanity must not be counted in a balance with other corporeal things. That's what she's saying. It's, it's above our human, our natural humanity. His sacred humanity is above everything that's created. 
This is in her life, chapter 22 again. That's a chapter which really talks about the sacred command in her life, chapter 22. One is to see created things through God. I keep a list of, let me go, oh, I, I think I told you this back in last autumn. I have a list of images that I keep. I use them to help me understand God's ways, God's uh, uh, traits. So like the sky, the sky. Uh, I take it as the presence of God. <laughs> whenever I look, I, whenever I think about the sky or see the sky, I'm, thinking, yeah, I'm, my, I'm remembering the presence of God within me. I'm using creative things to help me to remember that God dwells within me. Behave yourself. <laughs> the sky, the sky is everywhere. Wherever I turn, there's the sky. The sky just, uh, you know, even now, the sky, I can go out and still see the sky because he has the stars, has clouds, it's sunny, it's rainy, it's gray, it's blue, it can be green. You know, it has meteors, comets, aurora borealis, can have thunderstorms. The sky just represents everything, but it's everywhere. So it's taught me things about the nature of God, his traits, his characteristics. So I use the sky as my personal reminder of the presence of God, his overshadowing me, and so on. I was at a family picnic, perhaps home for vacation around to the lake and as I waited for the food to be cooked I was just in the lawn chair looking up and I was looking through the trees the maple leaves and the sunlight was coming through and there was a gentle breeze so the light coming through changed the green the various greens of the of the you know changed the green of the leaves into various shades of green and then with the gentle breeze you know fluttering the leaves I thought that's probably what the peace of God is like. That's what His grace is like. So I put an image to these teachings. You can do the same thing. Look for your favorite images. What does this say about something of God? Remind me. That's it. To use creative things to help me to understand about God. I use meditative music to, um, to know something about God. And his tranquility and his mercy. You know, I travel by car now. You know, that's how I travel now. I don't fly anymore. I don't. I don't want to fly. That's why, if I have to, it has to be the greatest emergency. But I drive everywhere now around the country. It's like my little hermitage. I don't want anybody in the car with me, <laughs> except God. My little packet of favorite communion of saints. They're in the back seat making jokes. <laughs> I saw you. <laughs> but I have my music. I have these certain music they put on. You know, it's very quiet, very meditative, very peaceful. And it just launches, it opens up my mind for to have, you know, thoughts of God. I'm looking at, you know, all of creation there. And uh, appreciating what's what I'm seeing and, uh, and so forth. See, you know, so it's like you know, seeing and seeing all this. I feel like I'm on expedition. Expedition is one of my favorite themes. I read books about men and women who went on expedition. Some never came back. <laughs> they disappeared. You know, Lewis and Clark. I read their expedition. I read of some others who went to Brazil looking for the lost cities, you know, other things. The ones who went to the Antarctic. You know, all, of, all these people went on expedition. So life is like expedition for me now. When I think about life, it's to me, it's I'm on expedition. You see? So I'm, so I'm trying to read it, so I'm trying to see everything that I see when I travel as if I've seen it for the first time. You see? Then comes a ball. I love. 
<laughs> bombarded with all these billboards. <laughs> Sometimes I don't even want to travel. I mean, to say to say religious sites. Lourdes is my favorite appar app apparition. I mean, I'm really, I, mean, I really love that whole thing of Saint Bernadette, Our Lady of Lourdes. And I would love to go to Lourdes, but you know, I, uh, I wouldn't want to see the cave, the grotto. Because it's not the same as it was, as it originally was. You know, so I, I really, really, in a way, I don't have any desire to go to the Holy Land. You know, because uh, Calvary is isn't what it was. I wish they would just leave these things alone, see them in their actual pristine, untouched, the way it really was. Why, you know, if I try to see when I travel, you know, creation as it was originally made. So when I, so when I look at humans, human beings, I really try to see Christ present in everyone. I mean, literally. <laughs> what makes that person Christ like? Uh, <laughs> I don't know, you know? It's just it's a reminder to me. These are little techniques that I have to remind me of what I'm called to do and to remind me of the presence of God within me and to be loving, to be fair, to be patient, and so on. This is all what I'm trying to pick up from Teresa and use the sacred humanity of Christ at every moment in my life. trying to see, you know, as clearly and as pristinely as possible. St. Teresa found her way of and to perfection. If he talks about, it's a phrase used in the Psalms that you probably know, the way of perfection. Lord, lead me on the way of perfection. Maybe that's where she got it. But it was the sacred humanity also in seeing how Jesus lived that helped her to come up with this this is the way, this is the path of perfection. And she would say that for her, Jesus is the royal road. He himself is the royal road to blessed union with the Trinity. So this is what our world really, and I see it, part of my if I can give something to the world in my talks and everything, is to have a renewed, revitalized understanding to give the world people as, as well as I can and understand the sacred humanity of Christ, as Teresa did. And to help people to remember that they are made in the image and likeness of God. And that through devotion through prayer, on the sacred humanity of Christ, to give us the grace to achieve this essential, what's of a sense, essence, and inherited dignity and sanctity that is God's gift to us, Jesus himself. So I hope I explained this enough to have you look more into the sacred humanity of Christ according to Teresa, her life, chapter 22, okay? Any questions? Any comments? Each one of us has the divine in us, mm -hmm. which is basically something that is not human, correct? So we have that tranquility, that peace, that eternity within us. Yeah. I mean, most of us, most of the human race, race do not, does not realize that it's there. I know. Only, or the church only a few wants percent to, do or ever have. Where the church wants everyone, literally everyone, to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Where the church is a missionary church. That's why we try to spread and we try to the understanding of it. It's all as it filters down. It's a beautiful, a beautiful hierarchy of 
our the structure of our faith from God all the way down to the tiniest little thing created. The church is trying to teach us of the touch of God on us. So we can touch others. But we don't really understand what it is because of our humanness, correct? That's part of it. We can only That's follow, part of it. like you're saying, what St. Therese and St. Uh, John and Jesus. Uh-huh. Like you said, Jesus is cut above us. Yeah. But Saint, the other saints have tried to show their way of of doing the divine, right? Or uh, yeah. elevating, elevating us to yes. their experience of becoming divinely human. And being that, this dogma of a communion of saints, that we're a part of that. But their formula, each one of their formulas, we're all unique. So, not all of us can follow a certain saint's formula to elevate our humanness. Correct. Right, but you've got to find it yourself. Yes, that's what you're saying. With making certain saints who you see in them, hey, this saint was this is saint, this saint was like me. <laughs> I'm like this saint. That's the saint I should embrace. I feel a natural affinity. If, if saint. this saint did it, maybe I can do something similar in my creative and unique way. Teresa, I'm convinced, is saying we just have to give ourselves to this endeavor and God will take care of it. But because of the fact that each one of us here is a Carmelite, Carmelite means that we were drawn possibly to the Carmelite, Carmelite way of elevation. Exactly. That's why he sees in each one of you something very gifted, which he put there. That and that means everybody has. We accepted the, the call to come You accepted this. it. Because yes. there's something in you that embraces this expression that comes to us from the Carmelite tradition, the Carmelite charism, that makes it possible through prayer to attain this overwhelming de- awareness of how divine we really are right now. And what we are capable of doing that sometimes we ourselves are just too amazed to believe. <laughs> but we may not know, we might not realize that the, the things we're doing become a cut above. Yes, mm-hmm. yes. Yeah. We have to have yeah. like real yeah. life common examples to realize, hey, we are reaching some yes. divinity in our lives. We just yes. don't realize. Yes. This is, this is, I think this is partly why the uh, growth in number of contempt, modern and contemporary saints by our uh, popes has, um, um, what's the word, uh, grown, just that word. There's more, they're, they're canonizing more people as to be examples for us. That, yeah, maybe we don't have to do great things. But to get the smallest thing can be the great thing. Yes. Because yes. we can affect a radical change in the place where we are and what we do. We just have to give ourselves to it. But are we, um, God is working through us. So just because of the fact that we're all here and we embrace this way, maybe we all don't realize that. Like you said, we're elevating ourselves, but God is using us for a purpose, correct? Definitely. Definitely. This is what you are going to be held accountable when you meet Him. Yes. yes. The one thing that you might be able to contribute to the growth of the glory of God, to the spread of the faith, to, to the to the change of heart in one person, This is what the Lord is going to ask you. So because we're elevating ourselves through our charism, God is using that. He is, he's, uh, he's, letting you he's using a greater force to use us. Yeah. You set an example 
Right. Exactly. Exactly. This is what he wants. He wants us to. But share. he's given us more power to do. That's it. He want, He literally wants us to share in his power. We hold back sometimes. This is this is the battle. The world doesn't want this. Uh, the devil certainly doesn't want us. And our our trials and errors and and the way that we have been grown, you know, how we grow up and being bombarded by worldly things, it distorts it, it, it stifles it, it stunts it. Talk about cigarettes stifling your growth. <laughs> the world, the devil, my own selfish interest stifles my growth and actual experience of this divine reality within us and of making my human powers able to do overwhelming, tremendous things. You see, I tell people, if you have been brought to caramel, then use caramel, what you have learned, your training in caramel, use what John, Teresa, Therese, Margaret Reddy, uh, Huet Edith Stein, Use what they're saying to help you to answer your questions. You don't have to go to Dr. Phil. He's a fraud anyways, I hear. The answer you can find right in your Carmelite tradition. I, this occurred to me when I was in San Antonio. And I was bombarded so much that I withdrew. Because I couldn't find the answers. And then it dawned on me and said, who do you think you are? I said, well, I'm a Carmelite priest. All right. Use your Carmelite training and your Carmelite heritage to answer your problems. Go search for the answers. And Teresa and John, I did. And I answered the problems. And I can say a lot of Carmelites look elsewhere for their answers. When we have been given... The hotline. <laughs> the question and answer. Right in our Carmelite uh, what's the word? Treasure trove. <laughs> and I tell people now if you're having problems, go look for the answer in Carmel. Otherwise, what are you doing here? Just added another badge to your shirt. Mm -hmm. You know? We gotta stay with it. Yeah. That's why I mean it's just it, day in, day out, John the Cross says, just live the faith. It loses, yes. It's 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 flavor. Because we go beyond, because we mature out of the sweet candy, we mature out of the consolations, we grow up. It's a matter of just day in, day out, living the faith, doing what I'm called to do, being responsible for my vocation, in what that vocation is, day in, day out, staying with the Lord. It finally breaks through, and everything starts to make sense. Thanks be to God. I had, well, I was given a grace a few years ago to see the faith as a whole. I mean, literally to see the faith as a whole, how it all works. I broke down in tears. I said, is this, is this really happening? I could not give a homily. I could not give a talk. I could not do anything for over a year without breaking down. Because the least thing I said about the faith was so overwhelming that it was the truth and the only truth. And that the privilege 
of giving this truth to people was so, you know, just so overwhelming. That again, I, I, I just, I just would break down. It was embarrassing, <clears throat> and it still happened. But, but this, this is the result of just staying with it, day in, year after year, being sick of the whole thing. You know, just sick and tired of the whole thing of the faith. I don't care. At times when I just didn't care about it. I don't want it. You know, I'm sick of and tired of the whole thing. I stayed with it. And finally just began to start coming together. And I began to notice things that were happening in my life that you could call phenomenal. You know, sensitivity. I could tell who was going to walk through that door without even knowing it. And sure enough, an hour later, that person walked right through that door. I mean, I could sense where to go, what to avoid, what not to do, what to say. You just be open to the Holy Spirit. I mean, mystical things are happening. This is what God wants us to experience. But we give up sometimes too, too easily, too quickly, too soon. This is why Teresa is saying it's all through the sacred command of Christ. Low locutions that really God gave me. Uh, other mystical phenomena I haven't had. I, you know, I, I didn't want them. But there were like sensitivities that I could say because of this that, again, uh, I could sense what was going to happen before it happened. And I, uh, and this is all a grace from God. This is what God wants us to experience. But it's really the faith. And seeing the faith as a whole, then you know, as I said the other day, it becomes simple. Because you know what, you, what your part, you have to uh, be responsible in learning, giving, protecting, and so on. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, it's, all, it's all here within us. Someone said, you know, the human person uses only 10% of their brain. Well, maybe, I think sometimes we think, we, I think we only use 10% of our real spirituality. Think of what we were using. If we were using 95% of the mystical graces of God, whole, all of life would be. <laughs> is, this, is this science fiction? <laughs> no, it's real. <laughs> Really, this I'm, I am convinced. I'm persuaded. This is what can happen. And um, this is the New Testament era. But you got you to stay, stay with it. It's there. There's there's a lot more. This I, you know I'm. I'm trying to talk, you know, talk, you know, I'm not talking about myself. I'm just talking about how God works in one. And uh, it's not me. Um, it's really all the Holy Spirit. And, uh, but there's a point in one's life that you, you really have to give yourself to God. And I mean everything. And you just, you just give everything over. Hand, you're, you'll handle this problem. I'll know what to do with this project. Lord, I'll know what to do if I have to sell the house or uh, help this person or not. You just, you just kind of do it spontaneously. There's a moment in your life when this happens. There's a moment in your life when you just kind of put faith aside and it's just all a matter of love. That you got to again go back to the Kairos, the right moment. You got to you're aware of this right moment when all of these things, certain things happen, and uh, but you got to you got to but you have to just keep at it. 
got to, um, it's, it's the paradox. You got to, you, you got to taste and allow yourself to um, uh, just go through everything that happens in your life. And to always, constantly be grateful. And to um, trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord, have confidence, but it's 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 this constant renewing the yes Lord, I'm with you. Simple as that. Perseverance helps. But I'm saying there is a conviction that one has to make that you stop asking why. You stop complaining. You stop completely doubting. And you are in the realm that it's it's yes, Lord, whatever happened. I mean literally whatever happened. There's, you're not questioning it. You're not, um, you're not even puzzled by it. <laughs> it's, yes, Lord. Uh, what else is there? <laughs> like Peter. Like Peter. I mean, what else is there? You know, the house falls right down before you, you know? Burns up. Oh, all right. <laughs> yeah, so what? <laughs> what am I to expect? It is. You know? Uh, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> I'm trying to explain something mystically here. But it's, uh, and Father, doesn't it go back to our baptism, though? Because that's, the indwelling of the Trinity there is a change. That's why it, it goes back, back to baptism. And that we grow. As it said, that initiates it. You are different before baptism, and you are different after baptism. There is a big difference there. Mm -hmm. You're just not. We have, we have a choice. You're just not baptized. Something, something so dramatic, so. And, and yet it's hidden, happens. There is, you're, you have been transported to a whole nother dimension <laughs> in baptism. That's what I'm trying to say. And that we are living in a whole nother dimension because of Christ, the Word becoming flesh. And opening up this new vision, this new hope, this new era, this new level in which we are living and moving and having our being. It's a whole other dimension. Okay? <clears throat> All I can say is that in season, out of season, we just have to stay with it. Regardless of what happens. We just keep moving what we would say ahead, forward. Using what? Moving forward using our cares or just our being influenced by the way, the level we are. Grace, will, our, our free will, our conviction that this, there is something to all this. And it becomes clearer but that's why God gives us the graces, meaning the virtues, that we have to hone, that we have to cultivate. Because it gets clearer as we cultivate these things, these graces. And, 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 and with prayer. Yes, it happens because of the sacraments. It starts to get clearer because of the sacraments. It starts to get clearer as we devote and commit ourselves to studying and learning about the faith. It gets clearer. And it gets more assured as we start to use all the other, uh, what do you call, um, 
accessories <laughs> that come to us, like bean and caramel. This is a, an added accessory. So we're moving forward to where? We're moving forward to our final end here on Earth to our life after this. To our transition from this life to the very heart of God and to that, as my mom called it, that moment. Whatever that moment is. However it is. We can sense a little bit of it. We can taste a little bit of it. We can appreciate a little bit of it. But when we get there, it'll be even beyond what we could ever have imagined. We're, we're, we're getting glimpses that, here, right? glimpses of it. We now. don't know. And that's why God keeps it a mystery for it to us. But He's given us more. He motivates us. Journey. He hands out, you know, the little carrot to us. You know, I've made you divine. You can sense it. You can understand it. You can appreciate. It. You can taste it. But here, here's more, and you're. <laughs> trying to grab it as he keeps pulling you back but as he is pulling back he's opened up more and more and more mm -hmm. and you're beginning to sense it even you're the panorama more and more and more you see but you might even have you might you might start to begin to have more sensitivities to the things and you're missing the like whole thing saying. you're getting more sensitive to the divine mm -hmm. and how your humanity is being transformed more and more and more in, into a divinity, a divine state of so being. Going up the ladder. Yes, yes. And there's two ways that God is helping us to do this. One, through your vocation, you know, well, the faith, you, you just, that's a given. But the vocation that one is given, or the various vocations one has, uh, and for us here, karma. Okay, these are the these are the avenues that we travel on to become sensitive. Others will take different avenues, but we got to stay on the avenue. If the car breaks down, we get out and start walking. Someone, someone may come along with a horse. We get on the horse. The horse may die. We go back to walking. We get dragged. Someone comes along with their little red wagon. We get pulled in the wagon. We stay on the avenue. <laughs> a wind comes along. A tornado comes along. A hurricane comes along. And I'm just being blown down the air. <laughs> closer and closer and closer. But all the time, we're getting so sensitive. Yeah, I'm sure of it now. I'm sure of it. I'm sure of it. This is what's happening. This is what's happening. I can't take it anymore. <laughs> and that'll probably and that'll be the moment when you're right on the edge between this life and just filter over into the next life. Like that. Get it? <laughs> that's, why we're, that's, that's why we're given hope, because hope is the test strip that makes us assured that we are on this avenue. As we grow in hope, hope deepens that assurance. Yes, I'm certain now. I am more than certain. I'm assured of getting there. That's what hope does. You see, hope just isn't. Yeah, I hope my mother-in-law doesn't come to live with us. <laughs> I hope I win the lottery. That's not hope. That's that's wishful thinking. <laughs> you see, hope is is it's 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 a it's a like it's it's a vital fluid. It's it's part of our bloodstream that gets richer as we cultivate it more, and it makes us. I'm on the right track. This, I, I am so assured of it. You can't tell me anything else. And that's why, seeing the faith as a whole, I really feel sad. I pain, I pain 
in my heart, in my very being, people who do not have the faith, who are struggling with the faith, for those who have left the faith, I, my heart pains. I am in painful sorrow. I feel it because they don't have the faith. And people who don't have the faith, I can't see how they can live. And no one, absolutely no one, because I try to put myself into, you know, to imagine, try to put myself, say, like in terrorist pr prisons. Say, what would they do to me? What would they? What ways of persuading me to give up my faith? And I, and I know, nothing can take me now away from the faith. Now I am absolute. It's. It's the fullness of truth. It's the absolute truth. It's the only truth. I've, just, I've arrived at this. But I had to stay with, with it. Thanks be to God. What God is doing in other people's lives, I don't know. I just try to appreciate it. Try to appreciate Him. Um, but this is what's happening. This is what's happening in you, Richard. <laughs> Knew it. <laughs> 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 it came, it came to you, right? <laughs> <laughs> with an hour. so minimal now that I just begin to toss it off. I said, yeah, you got upset. You, you, you question God. You, you know, uh, I get sick and tired of even doing this. As I was telling someone, you know, I'm really just sick and tired of hearing confession. I get, I get, I just. Why do I have to go off for mass? You know, these all, I, these, these things just come to me. They just, they're there. I get tired. But why do I even have to do this? <laughs> for a check. <laughs> That's my joke. I say, but Lord, I mean, it, it, it's like a, just a passing. You know, it's like a gas pain. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, you know, because behind it is I know, Lord. I say these things, and but it's it's momentary. It's just for the moment. And, I, and he says, "Yeah, I know, I know. This is what life is. This is what's going to happen. Don't worry about it." I said, "I don't. I just wish I didn't have to think these things and feel this way and get tired and have no enthusiasm." And I'm wondering, should I? Should I do this? Should I do that? Lord, you've been, you've been pulling me now for the desire for complete solitude. And what do I do? Clarify it for me. Do I go somewhere? Do I pray for it? What does that mean? Do I go be a hermit? Do I just go be a chaplain? Do I leave the province? Um, what do I do? Give me, give, tell me something. And he is. He's given me little inklings of what to do with the, my future. He even gave me this. Oh, he even gave me this little notion. It wasn't a premonition. 
just this little notion. I'm 64. Something just appeared, you know, with four on it. I said, oh, in 10 years, I'll be 74. I got 10 years left. Good chance I'll be dead. Hmm, interesting. I better get going on <laughs> all these things. <laughs> I got 10 years left. You know, looked at you know family history, some other things. You know, it was just a, it was just a notion. But then the Lord, but then it's like, well, so be it. So so that's it. That's it. You see, you know, and like again, I get, I get, uh, uh, what's the word? Uh, I get miserable. You know. But it passes. They, they just come by. These things, they just come by now. You know, they don't consume me like they used to. Mm -hmm. you know? But Father, you, you can improve yourself. And that's where your growth is. And that's what we want. you got to be you true to yourself. You want to reach yeah. That, that, yeah. that relationship with yeah. God to where if I'm miserable, He knows yeah. how I feel. I can talk to Him. Like, like you say, you talk to Him like, like He's next. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, yeah. I mean, that's what we yeah. want to reach. Yeah. You know. Uh, I want to I wanna present myself truthfully when I see the face of God. And, uh, so, you, so, so I just, just got to put up with these negative things that happen because I'm human, you know? Uh, I want to give up things more and more, and yet some things I don't, you know? I'm going to make a pig of myself. <laughs> <laughs> I used to, I really enjoy wine. Sometimes I began to drink too much wine. I said, Lord, take away the appetite. Not completely. <laughs> I said, Lord, just decrease it. And he did. <laughs> I began to notice, you know, I don't no, I don't I don't need another glass of wine. Thank, thank you. I'm satisfied with this one. You know? No, I don't want that that full body wine anymore. You know. He really did. And uh I mean I suffer from some of the effects still. But, but my prayer was, I noticed, hey, wait a minute, you're not getting much work done. <laughs> you know? And uh, so I'd have a glass of wine, have another glass of wine. And I said, well, there goes the evening. <laughs> and then I realized, you know, Lord, that's what I mean. I, Lord, you know, I'm, you know, I'm taking too much of it. I'm asking you to, to decrease the appetite. Like I said, don't take it away. <laughs> but just decrease it. And he did. He did. You know, and this is this is all part of the joy of living that you can really ask God for something and he'll do it. And you'll be surprised how quickly he does it. But you gotta get to that stage first. Because you can't ask uh, selfishly. You can't ask just to um, impose on him. I've learned this over the years. If you're going to ask something from God, you really got to ask sincerely. You got to show your sincerity about living and dying and sacrificing and and, and being committed in bad weather, in good weather, in troubles, in victories, in joys, whatever it is, you stay with it. And then God will say, you really are sincere. <laughs> and that's when he really starts to answer your questions. Because then you know what to ask for. You know what to, what you, and how to ask it. You know, and you don't make demands on God. You just simply ask it. And I, I mean, I'm giving witness. You'll be surprised how quickly he does answer. And I mean answer. I have a friend who uh, gave himself to God completely. And it took years and years and years and trials. And a, I mean, he was literally in the gutter. 
picked himself up, God, like through God's hands. God brought him, start, began to bring him along. Still 20 years go by, another 10 years. And finally, he just all was God. And uh, we're good friends now. And he just says, uh, you know, the business failed completely, but now I don't care. Because all I care about is what I can do for others. And God saw his sincerity. And I, I, this is my scenario of it all. And how he, how he explained it and how I'm trying to, you know, write the screenplay for it, <laughs> so to speak. That... You know, well, they started up the business again, you know, and uh, he said, to me, Lord, we need this check, we need this amount to stay open. Next day, someone out of the blue showed up with the up here, here's a check for X amount of money. And the man said, Goodbye. Roger asked God. The very next day, he was answered. I mean, that's how quick God will answer. You got to get to that stage. It takes work. I'm just saying that it is possible. Okay. To do uh, tremendous things. The most tremendous thing is to just to let God take care of everything. You just show up. <laughs> I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> Show up and ask him in. I'm ready. Yeah, I'm here. We went done today. Well, uh, look at sit back. Have a glass of wine. <laughs> 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 I'm busy with these other people. <laughs> but you know, uh, but really, you know, the thing is that it just what. What did, I, what did I say? The most amazing thing is just how tremendous um, you know the love of God when you give yourself to all this. It just, it's, it's just, uh, you don't have to do great things. You don't have to do, be, have mystical things. You know? Uh, you don't have to have anything. Just God. Uh, and, uh, and, and, what, and what the the most overwhelming thing to do is what what I it's just I just keep thanking him throughout the day. Thank you, thank you. I don't know what else to say, Lord, except, except thank, thank, thank you. He said that's good enough. That's all. So, someone has a question. I, I was just saying thank you for sharing. Um, you know, we all need to be reminded. You know, we get so busy in our lives and the different struggles that we're going through and i think sometimes we forget to ask god into those struggles mm -hmm. and um you know that's what you're sharing with us that really we need to be open and ask god in all of those different aspects of our life um to ask for the help that god really wants to give us he really does he really wants us to experience things beyond our our imagination He's just there, ready to give. He's ready. He wants so much that it is surprising how much he wants us to have and to experience. And uh, we really don't take advantage of it. You know, it's it's not so much a matter of saying so many roses, novenas. Getting to confession, going to the sacraments, or something even more beyond this is what he wants. He just he just wants our heart, a convicted heart, in doing what we have to do. You know, uh, this is where we part of our transcendence is that I don't have to build up credit to win God over. I mean, that may sound shocking, um, but again, it's it's part of the, the where you will get to on your um, adventure here. 
in life that you just know that the, I, these things can be put to the side and all all you have to do as I said just show up I'm ready Lord my heart's yours I didn't do the rest someone had a yes I just wanted to I read uh, something and it said that God created each of us for something special he created us he, he yes. had a mosaic of what we were to be uh -huh. and during our life we're putting our little pieces in that mosaic so when we die they need to match if yeah. not that's where purgatory comes in yeah. but it's the fact that, that God has created us all of us to do different things uh -huh. mm -hmm. This is what Carmel is supposed to help you to do. Find that little thing that you can make your own. And what you can then uh, cultivate and then give and contribute. And then you're adding to the glory of Carmel, which is then the glory of God. you got to find it. And, and something you just said resonates with something that you said earlier. And, um, you know, it's a recurring theme in Carmel that, you know, God is a coal miner because God is in the darkness and and you know when we start to think about God in term in human terms in in terms of our human relationships I mean God's not there at all because in in those terms God is way beyond and above that and he's in the darkness so you know he is all loving he is all forgiving he 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 wants to give us his love and mercy and um, you know we try to think about God sometimes as a vengeful God and wanting to you know that he's not going to forgive us but if we come to him sincerely he will do so yeah that's the sad image that so many people <clears throat> carry through life that's a betrayal that's a travesty uh, but it's so sad so sad that that's what people have been given by others as they grow up mm -hmm. and they go through life thinking that God is that way. Uh, God have mercy on, on, on them. And he'll under God will and God understands of course. And uh, for God, goodness. That's what pains me. You know, to go through, people go through life just wanting to live still in the Old Testament way. You know, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. This will be my idolatry. This is this will be my God. And uh, I gotta I gotta appeal to God. I gotta make blood sacrifices to God to win him over. To keep the God quiet. To keep the God, the bloodthirsty God, uh, still. And. Uh, so many people live with that impression, and that manner of life, that attitude, and that perspective on life. It's it's so sad. It's so sad, to say the least. Um, but part of what we have to do is uh, lower ourselves, as I said their level and help them rise above that have them experience their own re resurrection and uh, uh, help them find a new life right? this is all what you can find in terrible you know, the schematic is there you get the scheme in, you got the paradigm, you got you got the man.
on this journey. I don't know. We'll never know. Mm -hmm. They're not necessarily going to say anything to us, but we, people, with everybody in this room, I'm sure, have touched lives that we don't even realize. Some you won't even know. Some you don't even know how it all came out. Some uh, you, know, you won't you won't know the effect of the influence. But God is good. Because he will let you know some people the effect you've had on them. They will, they'll, they'll let you know. They'll come back. God is good in that way. And it's for your joy. It's for your certainty. It's for your assurance that, yeah, I am, I am having an effect. This is, a, this is good. You see, it's not that you'll never know. There will be some who will let you know the effect mm -hmm. you've had on them. It's like, you know, with mm -hmm. you see, Teresa, she, you know, she founds all the foundations, but what does she say in the deathbed? Daughter of the church at last. Yeah. So, you know, She didn't realize, you know, God did not permit her to see the future of karma, the growth, secular words, and stuff like that. But he permitted her to establish yeah. the distance from Yeah, it's like Moses. He didn't see the, he saw the promised land, but he didn't, he, he mm -hmm. didn't have a tactile, tangible experience of it, except for seeing it from a distance. But what's now? Yeah, sure. What's Moses? He's one of the greatest yes. figures in all of history. And the Transfiguration, he's yeah. there on yeah. Elijah. Oh, yeah. The Christ in and the gosh, he's on the screen every Easter. So I encourage you in your study, look for that theme in Carmel that just jumps out at you and you make your own. That one theme or that one fascinating idea about Carmel. You make that your own. You look for it everywhere in all of our saints. And you start to live it. You start to explain it to yourself. You start to talk about it to others. That's what you're going to find is what God's given you to give to others. You understand what I'm saying now? And it'll, it'll, it'll just take hold of you. And It'll just lead you on. And that's what you're going to give back to God. Be a karma. But look for it. Look for that one little theme. If I looked at all of our saints, they took one little theme, one idea of karma, and then gave it, you know, gave their whole life to it. And surprisingly, somewhere in the matrix of karma, it all fit in. To expand and spread and enlarge the, our, our Carmelite uh, charism. Okay, you understand what I'm saying? So, I believe, I, I don't want to say this, but I will. You're almost obligated to do this. And you've been given the gift. And, uh, to receive the gift is to give the gift. So God's expecting you, he's given you a gift to give the gift. You got to find it within the gift. Okay? So, whatever come back, not a cloud. I just, I just may ask you, some, some of you, did you find your one little piece of the puzzle there? For that one little thing and, uh, and make it your own.
that was your, what you're going to get back. You're going to become the expert on that in karma. So that you then uh, uh, are the voice. You're the uh, you're adding to what karma will, will be. Okay, that's where you're handing down the tradition. Okay. So, all right. Adoration. Yes. Both blessed sacrifice.